The second law of thermodynamics deals with thermal equilibrium. In its simplest form, this law states that heat always flows from hot to cold. We can make energy flow from cold to hot, but in nature, spontaneously, that will never happen. This is a pretty big deal because it applies to every object in the universe. Heat is moving around trying to make everything the same temperature. So ultimately, the universe is approaching a constant temperature. The first law of thermodynamics allows for heat transfer between objects. In theory, this process is reversible and heat could flow in any direction it wanted. But what we find is that it only moves in one direction, from a warm object to a cold object. Since we never observe heat moving from a cold object to a hot object, this suggests that there is a law that would forbid it. The second law can be restated in many ways, but ultimately what it does is forbids these processes from occurring. We have talked briefly about heat engines and the Carnot cycle, but it is the second law that really applies to how these work. Remember that a heat engine is a device that uses heat transfer to do work, so we are converting heat energy into mechanical energy. Many, many years ago, a guy named Hiro developed the first engine. Basically, the globe at the top is filled with a liquid. That liquid is heated and produces steam. We know that steam expands, and when it does, it comes out the tubes and causes the whole thing to rotate. Here we have a standard four-stroke heat engine. This is probably pretty much what you have in your car right now. As you may guess, there are four steps to a four-stroke engine, and this is known as the auto cycle. Okay, let's see if we can pause this just right. There we go. The first step is the intake stroke. As the crankshaft pulls the piston down, it pulls in a mixture of air and fuel into the engine. So this is our piston, this is the crankshaft. This is an open space in here. This is your fuel line. So fuel and air are being pulled in this valve right here when this piston pulls down. The second stage is known as the compression stroke. It is called a compression stroke because the piston is pushed back up into the cylinder, causing the gas inside the cylinder to compress. So you can see all of these little particles here that are now all compressed together. You also know that when you compress a gas, it increases the temperature of that gas. At the top of the cylinder is the spark plug. So here's our spark plug. The first part of the power stroke has the spark plug firing and the air-fuel mixture is ignited. As you might imagine, that chemical energy is converted into thermal energy, which leads to a big increase in pressure. This pushes the piston down by exerting force through a distance. So all of this gas, when the spark plug fires, it ignites the gas inside here that pushes that piston down. The second valve up here at the top is called the exhaust valve. The exhaust stroke of the engine pushes the piston back up through the cylinder and pushes all of the combusted air out. So here we go through the intake, the compression, the ignition, the power, and the exhaust stroke. And that is how your car runs. This site actually has several different models of engines, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, there's several different animations that you can look at and actually see how those engines work. In general, an engine needs two things. It needs a hot reservoir and it needs a cold reservoir. We know there will be heat transfer from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. And then you need an engine that acts in between the hot reservoir and the cold reservoir. The heat moving from the hot to the cold moves through this engine. The engine is taking in a certain amount of energy from the hot reservoir, which we call QH. Just like in our four-stroke engine, the heat energy is transferred into mechanical energy and used to do work. Now, not all of the heat energy flowing into the engine will be converted into useful work. In a perfect engine, it would, but in reality, there's friction, imperfect insulation, those kinds of things prevent us from converting all of our energy into useful work. So some of that heat energy will be lost to the environment. This gets dumped out into the cold reservoir and we call it QC. 
Because of conservation of energy, we can say that the difference between the heat energy coming in from the hot reservoir and the heat energy moving into the cold reservoir is equal to the work done by the engine. What we are really interested in here is the efficiency of the engine. How much work are we going to get out compared to the amount of energy we put in? The more energy we actually convert into work, the more efficient the engine. This is a pretty big deal, so let's look at our efficiency a little bit more. We can look at those two equations and combine them. This lets us get rid of another variable, which is always a good thing, but it also gets even better because we have a variable in both the numerator and the denominator, which means we can pull that out and we end up with 1 minus QC over QH as our efficiency. Now we are looking at a ratio here, so the numbers will not have any labels. We're looking at a percent. A couple notes on efficiency. First, for this equation, use positive values. Otherwise, we are going to get negative work, and that just doesn't happen. Also, should you happen to get a number greater than 1, you are actually creating energy. That would be awesome, and you should definitely publish that paper, but at this point in time, that is not able to happen. So suppose the power station transfers 2.5 times 10 to the 14th joules of heat from coal and 1.48 times 10 to the 14th joules of heat into the environment. What is the work done by the station? The heat supplied by the coal is the heat from the hot reservoir, so QH equals 2.5 times 10 to the 14th joules. The heat energy released into the environment is 1.48 times 10 to the 14th joules, so it is given the designation of QC. We can use our work equation since we know both the hot and cold energy transfers. So to find the work done, we simply take the heat from the hot reservoir and subtract the heat from the cold reservoir, and we get 1.02 times 10 to the 14th joules of energy. So what would be the efficiency of that station? We know all we need to know about the heat in and the heat out, so we end up with 0 0.408 as our efficiency, or 40.8%. We know we cannot have 100% efficiency in a heat engine. The big question, then, is how efficient can an engine actually be? Sadi Carnot, he was French, devised a theoretical cycle that makes all of the processes as efficient as possible. The way to do this is to make all of the processes reversible. There are a couple of ways to do this. One is to make the hot reservoir close in temperature to the cold reservoir. The other is to have an engine that either lets heat in very slowly or lets work out very slowly. As you can imagine, that's not very good for us because we really want our cars to go fast, and this does not make cars go fast. Now, if all of the processes are reversible, then the efficiency depends only on the temperature of the two reservoirs. So if efficiency is equal to 1 minus the cold heat divided by the hot heat, then we can also say that efficiency is equal to 1 minus the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature. This lets us be able to determine the maximum efficiency on a system based only on its temperature. So suppose a nuclear power plant has pressurized water at 300 degrees Celsius. Eventually the steam is condensed to water at 27 degrees Celsius. Calculate the maximum theoretical efficiency for a heat engine. Again, this one is pretty straightforward in that we know the temperature of the hot reservoir and the temperature of the cold reservoir. So to find the efficiency, we use the Carnot equation. Since we are looking at proportions, we do need to convert the Celsius temperatures into Kelvin. And we end up with 0.476, or 47.6%. So if we want to know the maximum work that we can get out of an engine based on temperature constraints, we can use this definition of efficiency with our work relationship.